My name is Arnold Prather. I was born in Longacre, West Virginia in 1932. I went to school in Fayette County in Oak Hill. After uh, living there for 17 years, I guess it was, I joined the Army. After serving a year and a half in the National Guard, I tried to join the Navy. They said there was a four-month wait list to get in the Navy. I joined the West Virginia National Guard in 1948 as a 16-year-old. I was asked how old I was, and I said I was going on 17, and the uh, recruiter said, just say you're 17. So that's what I said. Then after uh, being in the Guard for about a year and a half, I joined the Army. As uh, uh, When I got out of the uh, National Guard, I was a PFC. But when I went into the Army, I was told I had to take my basic training over again, so I dropped back down to a private E-1. And after uh, basic training, I was, uh, uh, for about 14 weeks, I was shipped to Fitzsimmons General Hospital as a, and was trained as a medic. I worked on uh, TB wards, at the outlying wards at Fitzsimmons, and also on the third floor of the ulcer ward. I was promised a promotion when I went in for the job I was doing, helping the uh, replace, medical replacements uh, school at Fort Sam Houston. When I wasn't uh, given the promotion I was promised, I re-enlisted for a six-year term, as I had planned on making the Army my career anyway, and I took, uh, went to the uh, personnel department and re-enlisted, got my papers, went back and talked to the captain and told him I was leaving in the morning. So that's why I uh, was shipped to Korea. After re-enlisting, I reported to Camp Stoneman, California, uh, and went by troop ship, which uh, was a fairly large ship. We had 16,500 men on that ship headed to Korea. I arrived in uh, Yokohama Harbor, and then from there, after two or three days, took a train from there to Osaka, and from Osaka the next day we went by ferry and arrived in Pusan. We arrived in Pusan, Korea, in January, the latter part of January 1951. I was assigned after arriving in Pusan to, uh, with a group, and we were told that we were going to be assigned to the 7th Division, 17th Infantry Regiment. We left there and went by train. Uh, the Korean uh, train was very slow. They had to uh, have guards in front of it going through the tunnels to be sure that there wasn't anyone up in there to blow up the tunnels as we went through. It took about three days, if I remember correctly, to get to uh, our assigned area. Then getting there, we were put in a training mode, I, I guess the best way to do it, say it would be that we had another two weeks of training. They told us, we're going to teach you how to climb and climb mountains and walk back down mountains and, and stay up at night and stay awake and uh, all that sort of thing that we were going to have to face when we got into combat situations. When, when we arrived, we, we were we were uh, assigned uh, equipment, given equipment by, by the uh, uh, supply sergeant, and boots, which we had, but we were new boots, new uniforms or different uniforms, and uh, fatigue jackets, and our weapons, and then we went on this training mission. I was saying that, uh, uh, that, that we had to learn uh, how much problem or how hard it was going to be climb up and down the mountains. I was assigned to Company E, 2nd Battalion. I was assigned to the 4th uh, platoon 
And I always told the guys, when I went in, I was made the last ammo bearer on the 57 Recoilers Rifle Squad, which is about as low as you could get. I had even the Katusha's soldiers, some above me. That's how far on the totem pole I was. So it, it, it was quite a come down from being uh, assigned, uh, going over as a medic and being assigned into the infantry. I guess they need infantry men worse than medics at that time. After uh, we were assigned to this training uh, company, I guess it was, we were told that, uh, uh, like I said, we were going to walk up and down the mountains uh, and uh, learn to stay awake at night. And in the distance, we heard artillery and, uh, I guess, mortar rounds. And it, it seemed like it was quite a, far, quite a long ways off, but actually it wasn't more than two or three miles, I guess. Uh, but to a new soldier or a new person coming in, it, uh, it, it could be really frightening at night when you're out there by yourself standing guard. We had a, uh, a sign that we were told we were going to go up and uh, start moving north. On the way, we come up to the Han River and we had rafts. The soldiers, there was about 11 or 12 in, in a raft. As we went across this river, the North Korean North had opened up the reservoir and let the water come down. The water was rising, and as we got across the river, or almost across, the, the raft started to capsize. So uh, myself and one of the other soldiers, and I'm not sure what his name was, but anyway, we jumped out of the raft to hold it to keep the others from getting soaked. But this other soldier and I got completely soaked. We were clear up to our chins. We got across the river and about half of the company got across and the North Korean opened up fire on us. Uh, this other uh, GI and myself had just taken our clothes off to wring the water out of them and we pulled our boots off to dump the water out of the, out of the, uh, the boots and when they opened up and the fire come down and I saw of course, I couldn't see the bullets, but I could see where they were hitting. And I've always said that if you have watched uh, uh, movies where the where the bullets are hitting sand and dirt, that's the way it looked to us. We really picked up and moved to a burn, who was which was a little closer to the mountain that we could get in behind. And uh, then we finished putting our clothes back on. As we went across, about half the company. Uh, had made it across and the other half of the company uh, were still on their way across and the one reason I remember what happened it happened to be on April the 9th 1951 that was the day that I turned 19 years old now the whole company was coming and the whole battalion we were getting uh, uh, tank support from back on the ridges back behind us shooting rounds up into the to the hills but as, as the rounds come in, it sounded like uh, uh, light machine gun and rifles were what was coming uh, hitting on the ground around us. We lost uh, two, d two deaths that day from action and several were wounded. I think one of our uh, 57 Recoilers rifle uh, first gunners uh, was uh, lost that day and it's just just one of the things that happen when when you're when you're in a combat situation, you never know. Well, on on the way to uh, up, up the hill, after we got up the hill, uh, the we I guess we didn't do it because I was on the weapons platoon. But the riflemen pushed the enemy off to the to to the north, and uh, we uh, there was a bunker up above and and one of the North Korean soldiers had been killed. He was in the bunker, and one of the old timers, he'd been there several months longer than us, and I think of the little guy from Texas, they called him Tex. Anyway, uh, he just pulled him out and rolled him down the hill, and, and then he sat down, it was about noon, and uh, he said, it's time to eat, guys. Well, these other guys are gonna go on up the ridge, and uh, so we sat down, and after this happened, the, uh, the the corporal, the, the guy from Texas, Tex said that, uh, 
what's the matter, aren't you going to eat? And neither myself or the others by him said, no, we don't really have a, uh, uh, we don't have any desire right now to eat anything because after seeing all the blood and the gore. Okay. After being assigned to the company, a platoon sergeant come in and talk to us, and he was telling us that, uh, 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 GIs, you look at these mountains up here, and if you look at them, say, I won't be able to climb that. It's too steep. Or, or, it's too rocky. He said, you don't want to look at that mountain in that way. All you want to do is take one step at a time as you're climbing, and you can do it. If you will, uh, GIs will notice that the the South Korean and the and the North uh, South uh, South Korean women will carry these A-frames and carry 55-gallon drums of fuel and water up up these mountains and you can surely carry a 48-pound weapon. Now, after we got to the top of that, that hill, and the platoon sergeant and the assistant platoon sergeant come by and said, we're going on up the ridge and check things out and see how things are, uh, uh, how things are going. Now, you just stay here and we'll, we'll come back and let you know when, when we have to leave. As we were sitting there, it wasn't long we heard a blast from behind and then later we know we didn't think too much about it as we were sitting there here come uh, four GIs coming down no actually it was just two uh, two two GIs one on the front of the stretcher one on the back and they was carrying something the assistant platoon sergeant was behind the, coming down and we said well where's the platoon sergeant and he pointed at the 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 uh, stretcher and said that's what's left of him. There was arm, part of a leg, and and we said what happened. Well, it seemed like he got in front of the marker up above, and the tank behind uh, the uh, behind our lines, back behind the river there, about uh, four or five hundred yards away, so thought he was an enemy a soldier, and he blasted him and blew him up. That was uh, that's that's another reason I, I remember. Uh, this so vividly because being my my birthday and uh, the platoon sergeant he's the one told us to take one step at a time the the night before we were to move out to cross the Han the platoon sergeant come in to the company and uh, he told us that we had had an ind a couple individuals shoot themselves in the hand to keep from going into combat he said that's a cowardly way to take it you never know. Uh, he said that uh, that's uh, you showed a yellow streak down your back, but you never really know how how you're going to react under conditions like that. Maybe their their fear just took over, and they they did that to keep them going into combat. But he said they would be court-martialed. On our way north, we went through several. Uh, medium-sized to large towns, at least to us, that looked like they're fairly large. Uh, Churwan, uh, Kumwa Valley, and Huachon Reservoir. Uh, that was a pretty good-sized town, and they had a large reservoir uh, in, uh, in that area. And the 17th Regiment did a lot of fighting around that area. We would come to a village on the way, uh, on our advance, and we'd have interpreters with uh, speakers uh, that come up close to a village, and we'd uh, have them tell all the villagers in the area in the village to, uh, if you if if you want to live, you better get out because we're going to destroy the village. As we're on our way north, making our advance. We come up to villages, we would uh, give the villagers a chance to get out of the village because with the speaker system and the interpreters, uh, Koreans that would uh, talk through the speaker system and tell the uh, uh, villagers that we're going to destroy the village. Get out if you don't want to die. And there were several times when we went in and destroyed the village and burnt the buildings, some of the uh, houses did explode. There was some munitions stored in the villages and we always figured the biggest one of the big mistakes they made when they made the first advance they didn't uh, destroy 
the infrastructure because that's what that's one reason that we thought that uh, the Koreans was able to uh, push them back so rap rapidly at the last the, after the first time they went through there because we didn't uh, they had too much safe havens to to protect themselves and and of course the villagers some of them helped them too uh, in May uh, 1951 we were assigned in our from our platoon our squad from the fourth platoon to go on a recon uh, mission and the C the CEO asked uh, uh, the platoon sergeant from the fourth platoon if he had any people to go and they wanted to take a 57 recorders rifle so I, I was a uh, ammo bearer for that and we went out on a finger and as we walked out several hundred yards and uh, the the the, uh, the uh, sergeant in charge of the, the of the uh, oh, the mission he said you fellows wait here and I, we we're going to go up and see if we can uh, see anything up above more and pretty soon it wasn't more than two or three minutes uh, we, we first we came up to a, uh, a burial mound they, they run about four feet high and and they're a pretty good size and we were sitting around and just leaning back had our ammo uh, on our back and the guys had taken the rifles off of their shoulders and we were just sitting there resting and all of a sudden the leaves and the limbs started falling down the guy run back said get over the ridge they're firing at us so as we got over we just jumped over and as we as we started moving back up the ridge to get uh, back toward our unit we looked back and we saw that they were just strafing just literally tearing up that mound where we'd been setting and we just missed uh, several of us getting hit severely or killed that day and that like I said I think that that was in about the middle part of May and the re one reason I remembered is to, is because uh, uh, I glanced back and saw what the the bullets had done to that mound it was very very fortunate that that I didn't get get hit that day when I uh, arrived in Korea, I was a private E2, and over a period of five, six months, I steadily increased in rank from private E2 to sergeant first class. In June, I was promoted to corporal and made a gunner on the 57 recoilless rifle, and that's when uh, uh, I had to. I knew how heavy it was because I carried it up and down many a mountain over there. Uh, I had an incident in June where the uh, we were on uh, on the move north, and the CEO called me up and said, uh, "Corporal, uh, there's a bunker over about 400 yards over about uh, one o'clock. Can you put a round in there? Let's see if we can knock that out." And I said, "Yes, sir." So I called for the ammo, and I looked around, and the ammo bearer I had was about 20 yards down, or 15, 20 yards down over the hill. I said, well, what are you doing down there? He said, I was afraid I'd get hit. I said, get that ammo up here. Here, here I was, standing on the ridgeline, ready to shoot that rifle, 57 recoilless, and he had gotten down because he's afraid he's going to get hit. Uh, we were pretty fortunate that the enemy didn't uh, sight us and knock us off the ridgeline there, too. Uh, he, this uh, ammo bear that took over for, in one of my, at my place, I guess, when I'd become gunner, uh, he was just a little bit lazy and uh, showed cowardice then because he was afraid he was going to get hit. Well, the, the, the captain said, can you hit, can you put, a, put around in that bunker? I said, yes, sir. So after getting the, the ammo, uh, we put it in. I fired and he said let's put another round in so we shot two rounds in it then we made a move over and went to the bunker where we had destroyed it and he had bl blasted it pretty good and but we did find a 51 caliber uh, Soviet uh, machine gun and also a US machine gun that had been captured from some of our forces sometime before but but no no enemy there was no if if they were there they got out of there before we got over there so and that, uh, that's one of, the, uh, one of the few times I was able to fire that gun at the enemy and, and hit what I was shooting at anyway. Uh, after uh, 
the incident uh, with the 57 Corliss rifle, we were on the move in, and, and I'm not sure where the area was at. Uh, being, a, uh, being a corporal, uh, you didn't know all those things. They didn't tell you. They just said go and you went. But anyway, we went up this ridge, and I was carrying the 57 Corliss rifle, and uh, we had stopped, and they said we're going to take a break here, and all of a sudden, uh, someone said, get down, a, a hand grenade went off. Well, I happened to be the closest to it. The hand grenade, I hit the ground, the hand grenade went off, it hit me in my boot, tore my heel off, put shrapnel in my heel, five or six pieces in my leg, and I had four or five pieces in my back. That happened on August the 8th. Depending on the date, August 8th or 9th, uh, 1951. When I went, when I was wounded, the, uh, the, the soldiers, and I felt, really felt sorry for them. It was so hard to carry, walk up that hill, and then they were just going to have to carry me down. But anyway, I was a corporal. They shipped me back to uh, uh, Mash Hospital after uh, the uh, uh, first aid station, and th uh, then I, they put me in an aircraft and flew me back to Tegu, uh, the MASH hospital in Tegu. I was there for 30 days. Then they shipped me to Pusan after I got out of the hospital. And while I was there, I got uh, noticed that I had been promoted to sergeant. So then they said, Sergeant Prather, you're going back to your unit. I thought maybe I might, might be able to uh, stay away but they said, you know, you're fit for duty. So I went back in, and I hadn't been back at the, uh, the unit more than two weeks. And they said, at the time when I was in the hospital, we had went through a battle, and I think it was Old Baldy. I'm not sure about it. I believe it was Old Baldy. Then our unit and our company had a lot of uh, 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 casualties. And when I went back to the company, about half the men there in my platoon, I didn't even know. They had, hadn't been there a month before. So uh, I guess because being the right place at the right time and experience, they promoted me to sergeant first class. And that was in October. And then uh, I was made, uh, made platoon sergeant. After we moved out of reserve, we, we were signed up to the punch bowl the 17th Infantry Regiment, and uh, we were assigned right next to uh, uh, the Marines. They had a unit there right next to us. But anyway, uh, being a platoon sergeant, uh, you know you were usually called in. The, the company commander would come in, call you in, and tell you what was going on, what was required. And he said something in one of the meetings. He said, uh, fellows, he said, you know, we're sending out patrols all the time. And he said, I would... If you think on it, he said, I can't make you do it, but he said, I would like to have a volunteer to lead a patrol. And I thought about it for a few seconds, and I said, you know, uh, Captain, I, I think I'd like to do that. He said, okay, Sergeant Prather, you get the men you want. Take about 16, 16 or 17 men, and uh, then you, you come back and talk to me, and I'll tell you where I want you to go. So I went back and talked to some of the guys, and I had all volunteers. I didn't have to appoint anyone. They were, most of the guys were gung-ho and ready to go. I have met a couple of them since then and talked to them, and they, they remember it vividly about what happened. We were, were told to go about 100 yards in front of the, of the MLR and watch for the stragglers from the north and or the south, and and just in case there was a uh, enemy patrol coming in, we were to engage them if we could surprise them and take them. The patrol we went on was a night patrol. We left about 11 o'clock, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and it took us about two and a half, three hours to get in a position, which would have made it about three. And at that time, the uh, uh, there was a lot of snow on the ground. It was about a well, foot and a half to two feet deep and very, very cold. And we found this grove of trees that he had told us we, we should look for where we could uh, uh, 
he left it up to me uh, to where w I wanted to put the patrol and to watch for these people. As we were waiting there, we'd been in position for about an hour, and we heard something coming. Now, I had a couple Korean boys, uh, Katusa soldiers with us that spoke fairly good English, and uh, they said there, there are uh, there are some Koreans coming from the north. And I, and I said, uh, how many? He said, I think it sounds like three. I said, okay, let's wait till they get there. And I had, had a couple of the, uh, the, uh, the guys in the unit go out. And so when, when we told them to halt, they could stand up so they knew they couldn't run. And we went out, uh, half of us went out and talked to them. And the, the uh, soldier... Uh, the, the interpreter said that they said that they were uh, uh, refugees. Now we didn't necessarily believe that because uh, one of the one of the fellows in in the uh, uh, patrol, as we were talking, he had a BAR, and as as we were talking, all of a sudden the BAR went off, and he said, "I turned." I said, "What happened, Corporal?" He said, "He tried to grab my BAR." So he shot him, shot him right in the stomach, and the uh, the North Korean lay there and died. But we had two left, so I sent a couple of the soldiers back with them and sent them back to the line, and we went back and took our position. And about daylight, we went back to our MLR. In January, I think it was January the 6th or 7th, I'm not sure about the date, I believe that's right, we found out that we had enough points to rotate. It took 44 points to rotate, and I was there in a combat situation for 44, I mean, for 11 months, which made 44 points. That's why I was able to get out. Uh, the, uh, it just, the, the company, uh, the first sergeant come down and said, uh, Prather, you and Van Cleave and uh, some of the, some of the, in, and some, some of the other guys that come in at the same time, you're all rotating together. So be ready to go in the morning. So we walked down the hill, got on a bus, and went to in, back to Incheon. As we went through uh, Seoul, I, I talked to some history students in the area, and I told them that uh, uh, I've been in the Seoul uh, several times, and when I went back through it, I only saw four or five buildings standing. Uh, that weren't destroyed. And when I went back to that reunion in 2000, uh, there's hundreds of thousands of buildings and the city is thriving and, and I think we did, uh, we did good. That's the best way to put it, I think.